Tengo que preguntar, ¿cuántos no habláis español? Es una pregunta genial de preguntar en español. Le digo porque, o sea, lo diré en inglés. So I was asked to, to deliver this, this one speech in English, but that makes only sense if people really don't understand Spanish. So, can you lift your hand if you are really not proficient in Spanish and Spanish jokes? Okay, then we do English. <coughs> so you have to understand that the level of jokes is going to be slightly different. <laughs> will still be okay, but uh, yeah. So I just need to make a really quick sound check um, because as I'm running Linux, uh, need to make sure I have sound in place and stuff like that. So audio and HDMI, hoo hoo, beautiful. Okay, I'm sending you the classic left-right sound test. You get it? No? Nope. Okay. Again? Yes? Genius. Okay, we have sound. That's beautiful. So, um, <clears throat> do you like my desktop? It says, eat more fruit. <laughs> so, um, my name, is, my name is David Cuartillas. I'm co-founder of the Arduino platform. Uh, it's a project that started 13 years ago. We are on the way to the 14th year, which is fantastic. Um, my talk is going to be about uh, robots and kids that graduate high school and robots and uh, people that make their own segues and eventually electronic confession booths and maybe robots and eventually plants that tweet when you forget to water them, but especially people that creates religious cults. This is a track from kids graduating from high school in Sweden, and they go around saying that they know Arduino. So we basically created a religious cult. This is Tony, a colleague of mine. He was like, what the? So yeah, I designed the first Arduino board. I should say co-designed, because nothing is designed nowadays in isolation. But also, I'm a... <clears throat> A lecturer on my way to senior lecture at Malmo University, which is a beautiful university at the end of the world. There's actually something that is even farther, but I don't go there often because it's like a big, thick cloud that doesn't let you cross. <laughs> and um, I'm a research fellow at the Internet of Things and People Research Group, and it's a place where we look at how technology evolves and how it's adopted more and more by people. And in the last 15 years of my life, I spent a significant amount of time analyzing technology as some sort of religion. And I wrote this book called Platform Design. So every time I go to a talk and I hear people talking about platforms and infrastructures and serverless taking over apps and apps taking over infrastructure and whatever, I think, oh my god, it's the same loop again and again. Um, I totally recommend this book, it's for free, it's uh, open access at Mambo University Press, and it's extremely good for uh, holding your sofa right when you lose one leg, and if you print it, I'm falling asleep when you are in one of those insomnious nights when your program is not working. Then you read my book, and everything feels it's a lot better. Um, after 15 years of work, the night before delivering my speech, or actually defending my thesis, which was a really painful process, I'm the one person that if I become a politician, I become president of a country randomly, nobody can question that I pass my doctoral thesis. It was a three hours exam, and there is 80 witnesses. And, um, but I made a sculpture, a plexiglass sculpture, that represents God. And uh, it's a technological God, and God sees, sees things in a pixelated way, and when you look through it, you actually see the stomach of the beast, which is a bunch of wires and microchips and so on. It's several layers of plexiglass that represent the different layers of a PCB, and it's like 70 centimeters, it's beautiful, and so on. And uh, can you believe that the university is the only thing that they asked? They wanted to keep the plexiglass sculpture? 15 years. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, what I do is that I, I work in making complex things easy. And this is a project we made in 2010, when you guys still were walking around in diapers and programming in Python. And uh, so what we did was to try to make very easy for designers to create the appliances of the future. 
because we envision that in the future, appliances will be controlled through touchscreens, that is a virtual world, and they were anyway controlled the physical world. And we thought that it would be very important for designers to get the opportunity to rehearse how those appliances would work. So here we use mobile phones that talk over Bluetooth to electronic circuits that control real stuff. And we had to give this to people that had not a lot of idea about programming and electronics. So it was quite a lot of development, especially because Froyo, the Android version back then, was not very helpful. But we made it work. And we made it work thanks to the fact that we built this platform that allowed people to build things on top of it. And I'm going to guide you through a bit, some basic ideas on what is relevant in a platform. So first of all, what is the ecosystem for a platform made of? Well, it's made of boards. A lot of people think that Arduino is only boards. And that's why they typically go to buy their boards at the wrong places. Um, that's a critique to you buying cheap in Amazon. Go to our Italian shop, because we sell only Italian fashion. <coughs> so anyway, this board uh, is the most copied open source hardware design so far in the history of humanity. And this is since open hardware license exists, because before open hardware licenses, there were other things that were massively copied, but they were not registered and licensed. And people use this board, the Arduino Uno, to do things like robots that sort. Yeah, we'll have to lower the volume on all the, <laughs> the videos with kids screaming are extremely painful. Um, so this is a robot that sorts color balls. When I graduated in 1998 from my master's in te telecommunications, um, this was a typical project for a master's student, like in a big industrial robot, right? But this is made by three 11-year-old kids from Jaén in Spain. And their classmates, four girls, made this machine that delivers pills to their elderly people. So this, if I go to a master's class in design and I tell people, you're going to have to design something for the elderly, they typically come with an electronic pill dispenser. You know, now 10-year-old kids can do design the exact same thing. This says a lot about what's going to happen in the future. We will all take pills from electronic pill dispensers. And uh, a couple of other kids decided to make a drone that can fly for as long as there is sunlight and can report uh, uh, important metrics, for example, from a fire in a forest or whatever. And they had this genius idea that instead of sending digital information that had to be monitored in computer screens or whatever, it will actually uh, hijack the walkie-talkie signal and would make a text-to-speech conversion and just radio, sense with radio back voice, telling the fireman, hey, man, it's 45 degrees, there's for sure a fire here. Um, but Arduino is also used for other interesting things, like, for example, challenging human cognition. And this is a project made by one of my students that consisted in transforming the normal computer keyboard into a single line alphabetically ordered. I mean, in this crowd, I don't need to explain that the QWERTY keyboard that we all use is basically 30% less efficient than what we can do. Well, if you put everything in alphabetic order, it's about 1% of the efficiency of the QWERTY keyboard. Just type in your name, is like... And also, Arduino can be used for very important things for the humanity, like hacking cars that can self-drive. You know, this whole thing that Tesla is doing, Google is doing, everybody are doing, well, with an Arduino board and four days of your time, you can build a robot that can self-drive. This is for real. This is Chevrolet paying us to make a robot that self-drive, okay? And they're sitting in the driver's seat and pushing pedals and changing gears and, and yes. <laughs> yeah, four days without sleeping can put anybody in danger. <laughs> so, um, but Arduino is now 13 years old and um, uh, we've been looking at how to update the way we interact with our community, because it's very important, actually, to, to keep up to date with the conversation of what's going on. And that's partly through exchanges with users, and it's partly through observing what's going on. So we had to update the way we design our boards to create something that is more contemporary with the, contem con the things that are happening right now, which is like people are willing to work in a multitude of different wireless protocols, and they're willing to do a lot of stuff. And if you want to make it very easy for people to learn how to implement the future of IoT, it should be very easy to basically change 
you know, intelligence and wireless communication, like as, as easy as And uh, it should be very easy to make experiments like measuring how something moves. This board has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and uh, accelerometer and gyroscope. So you can very easily make all of these experiments. And so we have the, the, this kind of board, which is more for like engineering students, but we have this kind of board that is more for high school students, because since we've been around for 13 years, many teachers already have a whole bunch of equipment that they use in the lab. And it's very important to respect legacy, especially in education, because it takes five to 10 years for a school to renew their equipment. And the interesting thing of this board is that it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, accelerometer, gyroscope, and a really pretty RGB LED because who is not drooling in front of RGB LEDs? And the kind of things you can do with it is, for example, hacking the Pokemon game. So this is just a battery and that board you saw. Well, it's a previous version of the board, by the way. It's the 101, but this is a 102. And that will automatically swipe and catch the Pokemon. So I know that many of us nerds don't like to exercise, but we love to catch Pokemons. <laughs> this is bringing exercise to the next level because you have to lean down and up. So it's <laughs> adding one more level of complexity. So, and you just need to root your Android phone and install the script that when Nintendo discovers you, they basically kick you out from the game. So be careful. You don't want to sacrifice all of your exercise time. So, <clears throat> so we have this idea of modularity at the electronic level, which is that because we have a standard, we have built a standard, and I think this is very important because many of you guys I know build software, and you know when you build software, it's super important to figure out how to share that software, and you're building a privative software, shame on you, go home and cry on your pillow. <laughs> and if you're building open source software, I hope you're commenting properly, and you realize that that reg X is not properly written, that's no mom will not understand it. <laughs> so um, in hardware, basically what happens is that since we started this idea of like, please feel free to add whatever you feel is important, many people started to create what we call shields that they put on top of the Arduino boards to do other things. And this is a snapshot from a shieldlist.org, which is a website that has hundreds of different possibilities. And um, one of them being for example, this one, which is a shield made by some high school teachers from Spain, and they do it as like a friendship kind of thing to help other teachers teach technology. And uh, it has some basic experiments, like how you make a traffic light, how you control motors, how you read a light sensor, and so on. With this, you can make more or less like 10 lectures in technology, which will be something like three months in a normal high school class. So it's 10 experiments. You can build the robot, you can make a lot of different things. And these kids, or these kids, they are older than me, but <laughs> these guys, they, have, they made an e-publication, and every year they make a crowdsourcing, they crowdfunding, they ask around, how many do you want? And they get 100, and they sit together, and they solder them together, and they send them to other teachers. But Arduino is a computer that requires a software to program it, and this is the Arduino software, and I know that many of you will say, I love my Atom or uh, Visual Studio. Shame on you for Visual Studio, by the way, but I don't like Visual Studio. <laughs> And um, you know, I, made an, I went to Eclipse conference, and I, I showed people at Eclipse conference how you could program Arduino with Eclipse. And it took me like several complicated combo keys to launch debug. <laughs> and I almost got like a, like a, like a mouse problem injury in my, in my elbow. <laughs> because if you want to teach how to program, you just need to compile. You need that one button to compile. What do you need like five buttons to compile? Anyway. This software is so bad and so hard to use that it's downloaded once every 2.5 seconds. So if you don't like it, maybe you should reconsider. And instead of complaining, just making beautiful pull requests. <laughs> so what happens is that by creating this nice ecosystem of things that work and that people use on a day-to-day -day basis, that becomes a sort of an infrastructure for people to build on top, other projects emerge that can use it to build their own things. And for example, BricoGig is a, a company that creates tutorials and sells equipment and so on. MakeBlock, which is the robot that I bet money many of you bought for your knees, uh, that you can buy at airports for 120 euros, is 150 cent, uh, 150% based on Arduino. You know? Even the, the first boards even have the Arduino shape. 
And um, Arduboy makes this beautiful credit card size Arduino game consoles, really, really beautifully crafted. And for example, Ardusat, which is this company from uh, California that launches a satellite that's orbiting around the Earth and has the equivalent to eight Arduino boards inside. So you can make an experiment in class, and then you can beam the experiment to the satellite and test it and compare the results between measuring some variables on the Earth's surface and on a satellite and see if the math fits. So when I say that the future of education is nothing that we can imagine, it's because there is a lot of things that are already happening now that you probably didn't know before you entered the door to this lecture. So Arduino has become such a standard that some companies are using it for showing off that they are able of doing things. For example, this is NextFlex, which is a company in California that makes flexible circuitry. And as a way to prove that their circuits work, they decided to make a compatible Arduino board so that they could prove that the thing worked properly. It's great because this is the most seen video in the Arduino website. <laughs> and people keep on asking us, where can we buy this board? And the best part is that we don't manufacture this board, right? <laughs> so please don't ask me. If you want it, call NextFlex. You know. So this is my first reflection. Openness is very important. We've built an open system for people to build on top. And if we talk about the future of, of education, I think openness is very relevant at many different levels. It's relevant because it allows people to look inside, to learn as much as they need. It, it's relevant because it allows people to eventually build systems that just cover their needs based on your own stuff, even though they are different. And it allows people to show off because they build a common language on how things can be made. Um, by, to us, by making things open, what happens is that we grew a very large community of users. And um, I'm going to show you the first project ever made by a person I don't know. This was the beginning of the rest of my life. It was September 2005. We started Arduino in March 2005. And in September, a Chinese guy said, I'm building a robot for my class in mechatronics. And they asked me if I could control it with a microcontroller. And I was thinking using Arduino. And the only thing Arduino had was a website with hand holding a board saying, it's for free, copy it. <laughs> we didn't sell anything. We, we were an open source project. We had no idea anybody would be interested in getting this thing. So we shipped this Chinese guy a board, and he answered with this video. And this is a predecessor to the smartphone, because it's 2005. So smartphones didn't exist. And this thing talks Bluetooth. And that robot on the floor has a Bluetooth chipset and an Arduino serial board. And there you go. So it's the first ever made Bluetooth-controlled Arduino robot by a great engineer and a really bad cameraman. <laughs> and um, I mean, the resolution sucks big time. And um, we had a conversation. I told him, you know, I would love to show your video in my lectures. Could you send me something with a bit better quality? But the English-Chinese uh, conversion didn't really function properly, so he sent me a 16 minutes long video of the same. <laughs> anyway, here you see how it works. If you're interested, actually, you can get this robot, because he didn't design this robot. He has built it for his class. This robot is from a Japanese company called Gaken, G-A-K-K-E-N. And uh, it's kind of a kit company, and it's really, really beautiful. It's a multi pid robot. So, this was just the, the beginning of something. A lot of people started to use Arduino all over the world, and nowadays when we celebrate the Arduino Day, which is the Arduino birthday, we get as many as 529 birthdays simultaneously in 94 countries. At some point, Arduino had 400 distributors in over 100 countries in the world. So we literally built an open source project that is designing and selling uh, physical stuff all over the world, and on top of that, allows people to make their own in case they need it. So the only way we can track how many people are engaged with us is by looking at our website. Our website registers 26 million unique users per year. So this is more people than the Swedish National Bank, which is the country I live in, Sweden. We are like 9 million people, if you can count all of the other people as people. And um, that was a Swedish joke, by the way. Um, we have a forum that counts as many as 580,000 registered users. But to be fair, because we are all here among internet people, we know that half those people 
are not really in the forum any longer. But this is because we keep a history of the forum for the benefit of everybody. So this forum goes back 13 years, so all of the accumulated knowledge of the forum is still there. And it's possible to keep on reading all of this stuff. For us, it's very important that you can find information when you're building things, and that you can engage in conversations about whether things work or don't work. It's, it's running on nine different languages, by the way, my, the main languages in the world. And at some point, we realized that <clears throat> yeah, there's been a change, there's been a shift from the time we started until now in how people use the internet and how people register how they're doing on the internet. For example, in a room like this, if I ask in 2005, how many of you had a blog? Everybody will lift their hands. So I'm going to ask this question, how many of you have a blog? This is really sad. <laughs> how many of you use something like Medium? This is a bit better. How many of you use Instagram? <laughs> okay, yeah, <clears throat> this is normal. This is, this is the evolution of software and services and apps. It's very normal. The problem is, and as an open source project, that is a multimedia open source project, we do things that are not just software. We do things that require mounting things, telling the story, explaining about the sensor you found, explaining about how you build something. It requires a different way of documenting. And we used to document everything on blogs. Not on our blogs, it's on people's blogs. And we were basically collecting the links to where things were on the internet, and people could look at them. But what happened when that design student suddenly got a job at this fancy office? His blog disappeared, right? Or that other great engineer, when she got to program for Google, and suddenly she couldn't show any more stuff, because everything she did became secret. Or that person that makes a blog and forgets about it because he or she gets kids and it's a lot more busy for a lot more important reasons. And the blog doesn't matter no more, right? What, who suffers is obviously not that person. Who suffers is the 100, 200 people per year that are looking at that information for building their projects. So we realized we had to build our own repositories. And we started with an open wiki where anybody can document things that is community uh, maintained. And with lately Project Hub, which is basically a project repository like Thingiverse or anything like that. <clears throat> which is a bit more curated. But we very quickly also realized that uh, as in education, you don't really learn everything you know, from the internet, whatever people say. You also need human contact with stuff. And we realized through the Arduino birthdays that something was emerging, that was some sort of like a locality around Arduino, which is very strange, because when we built Arduino, we were five people that met at Iberia, Italy, for three months, and then everybody went their ways. <laughs> And then we built an open source project on distance. We've been documented as the perfect distributed company at some point. And um, <clears throat> very slowly, what we believed that everything could just be global. You know, when you don't have friends in your neighborhood that like what you like, you use the internet to find friends at the next neighborhood. But if your neighbor is doing the things that you like, then you talk to your neighbor. It's a lot easier. You knock the door, you share a beer, you go together, right? So what's happening right now is that uh, there is some sort of local community emerging, so we built the Arduino user groups as a way to build a different way to transfer knowledge among people around themselves. And they typically emerge from arranging an Arduino birthday party people meet, and from there they start to meet on a monthly basis or whatever. And one of my favorite ones is the one in Valencia, because people basically meet in a bar, and they have built their own like wireless soldering irons, and they solder stuff, and <laughs> it's really cool, very recommended. So the question is, <clears throat> how can you build transferability in your systems? How can you build transferability of knowledge? What is, this is the thing that I, we've learned from the community. People build stuff because they want to share something, but how can you make this thing remain over time? How much of an infrastructure you need to build as a project? And how open you have to be, open-ended you have to be about how people are going to use stuff? And this basically leads us to education. <clears throat> And education is a lot of different things. Education happens in this virtuous triangle of the home, the school, and the direct interaction with other people. You know, it's like you have to take everything into account. Education is just not, not just happening at school. I mean, those of you that think that you basically can send your kids to school and they will learn, you're so mistaken. And I'm being joking, but seriously, just some food for thought. So since I'm working with electronics, the thing that is very relevant to me is how physical computing, which is the building 
interactive devices can't result in bringing high motivation in students to keep on learning. So building things in a way engages you into continue to learn more stuff and dig deeper in deeper in how things work. And I've been working with this for 18 years. This is what I do at Malmo University. I invent ways of teaching. And um, uh, the first thing I did when I did with, decided to deal with electronics is try to figure out how to bring in complex topics and how to build class dynamics so that people could get engaged. And when we talk about designing the future of education, it's not about designing the next gadget. It's about designing a whole ecosystem with interactions with people, school teachers, and so on. In this particular case, my students, <clears throat> this is the result of the fifth day of class. The Friday of the first week, they should be able of building an interactive toy. I hear they build some sort of like a <clears throat> competition-based uh, Simon Says. And if you lose, you have to make something. In this case, he has to make the monkey face. I have another one where Johannes also loses, and he has to make 10 sit-ups. But you don't want to see that one. Okay, but what happens at the end of the fifth week? My classes at university, they are condensed in five to 10 weeks. And at the end of the fifth week, the students are capable of building a full interactive system. In this case, it's a computer game that represents um, a train platform that is on a planet without gravity, and they need to pump the train platform so that it moves, and they need to pump in rhythm. And then when they were building it, they were body storming the game, they realized that playing face to face was not good enough because they couldn't look at the screen. So they had to somehow reinvent the controller and make it work in an angle. So here you see how they prototype different things, they prototype the technology, and at some point they come to the idea of rebuilding stuff in an angle. And um, that's the whole final machine. And then you see them trying out the game. So if you're curious, it's made in Unity, so any of you can buy this without spending a dollar. And you just need some carpentry skills. And if you don't pump at the right time, you lose. Here they lost in the final line. And if you go a lot to the gym, you can always win. There you see that guy, he played a lot of Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's our goal in Arduino? Well, our goal is that when kids go to any sort of education, they actually benefit from it, especially when it has to do with digital technology, because we believe that digital technology is really going to rule the world. It's already ruling the world. But we don't see that. People don't tell us. Because embedded technology, ubiquitous computing, are paradigms that are based on the idea of hiding technology so that we can keep on doing what we're doing. But the interface towards more and more technology makes the technology go farther and farther behind the scenes and becomes harder and harder to understand what it's doing for us. So I, I, lot of, I read a lot of comics, like I bet anybody in this room. And um, I love when I saw this comic from Batman. This is a, a version where Robin is a girl. And it's saying like, so what did you learn about computers, Robin? He says, I had to learn something in school. And you know, this is, this is interesting. I mean, I meet a lot of kids at the end of the day. And my mission is that when they go home, they actually feel that they learn something. But I realize that for the kids to feel that they learn something, the person to interact with is not the kid, it's the teacher, and it's the school system, and it's the politicians, and it's the parents. The kid is the, is the ultimate beneficiary of this action, but we don't design for the kids, we design for the teachers to have a system that they understand that they can handle. So we came to this idea of how to make teachers into hackers, and we invented this method where we took the way we were teaching at the university for so many years, and we expanded it so it could work at school. Because at my classes at university, I basically teach five days per week, eight hours a day, five weeks in a row. So I took that amount of hours and I said, okay, in 45 long classes, three classes per week, how many weeks do I need to make the same course? And it came down to six to nine months. And it's six to nine months because it varies a lot from school to school, they have vacation periods and a lot of different things. So, we decided we have to teach the teachers as they are running their classes. So we invented this method where the teachers explore different topics, which is the B in my slide, and as they explore different topics, they teach the class to the students. And it's very challenging the first year you make this thing, 
because you don't know what comes next. It's like you're reading this novel as a teacher, right? And you don't know the result of the novel, but then you're telling the story to your kids in the afternoons, and the next morning you're reading the novel again, right? Um, but I can tell you this method really works. This kind of like agile, is totally an agile <laughs> implementation with sprints and, you know. And um, it ends with a technology fair because we removed exams from the picture, and then kids come and show the results to other kids. And we make these fairs across different countries. So this one is in Catalonia. And um, it was in Barcelona this spring here. In Barcelona, we've made five years this project already. And actually, this week, we're starting this project whole Spain-wide. So the whole of Spain is going to have 220 schools new running this, plus 300 from other years repeating. And this is what you see. You see 4,500 kids coming to a museum, completely hyped, because they're going to show their stuff to other kids. I can tell you the level of energy you feel when you see these kids is, you know, unbearable. And um, you see some places that repeat, like the bubble blowing machine. I've seen it for three years in a row in different installments, you know, but that's part of the learning process. At some point, innovation kind of fades away, and the only thing you see is kids that are actually learning stuff. So the project stopped being new or completely new, but that's not the most, that's not the most important part. As kids are working with something more like a socially concerned, like how to re renovate or renew water and build water cycles. There is a lot of Star Wars going on. Well, yeah, I get emotional, so I will not. Uh... Oh, self-made drones are great. Also very dangerous, but they're great. So in five years, we reached 1,700 schools, 40,000 students. And you will say, but David, this is not too much, you know? We've seen numbers in the previous lectures, like, oh, my bot was playing with a billion people. Well, the thing is that it's people teaching people. And this is how much you can do. And what we're trying to do is build a rhizomatic network where we teach teachers that teach other teachers. And in that way, we slowly expand until we cover a whole nation. And we will have a whole nation. We'll move to the next nation and we'll slowly build a network of people that understands technology and they can use it in teaching. But at the same time, we realize that there is a different level of teaching, which is university, where Arduino was used, but not too much, because it's too easy, you know. How many of you graduated in the last five years? Not that many. Where are your young junior developers, people? Should be coming to conferences. Anyway, I don't know how many university teachers told me that Arduino is too easy, that's we don't want to teach it at school. And I was like, Right. So we said, let's make something really freaking complicated. <laughs> so let's go out and discuss with MathWorks, which is the company that makes this beautiful software that is used at every single engineering school. It is not open source, though, but we had to deal with it. <laughs> and, um, and we decided to build a kit that contains three projects that are really challenging for engineering students. So they can challenge, challenge each other right, and compete and see what, who makes something best. Here you see Julia building this motorcycle. And uh, this is a motorcycle that runs on two wheels and has an inertia wheel that will compensate for the leaning angle. The, the news in here is that you don't program this with C code, you program this with Simulink. So you write your control algorithm in blocks, and then you upload it to your board. And since you're using a board, which is one of these maker boards that has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you can send the data in real time back to the computer, and you can read what the robot is doing. Or you could eventually implement an intelligence back in the computer to add intelligence to your robot. You can prototype a real thing, moving around, controlling stuff in the real world, and add as much intelligence as you want to. So from the series of bad cameramen but great engineers, I present the self-balancing motorcycle. This is one of the guys from MathWorks showing off. And his friend should go to a media class. <laughs> I love these moments when the camera actually goes completely out of vision. <laughs> and there you go. And then it's balancing for some seconds, and then it says, oh, no more, and falls. So we published this. In, in the motorcycle project, we published this. We, we gave, you, so you get the idea, the content you have to produce to get a person 
from nothing to a moving motorcycle is the equivalent to a 595 pages long engineering book. So it's a real engineering task where we teach every step you need to understand about how to control motors, how to control the inertia wheel, how to build sensors around it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we tell them, now you can make the thing move straight. <laughs> Good luck. So people say, OK, I will make it move in a curve. And this is a video that was put together uh, by one student. And he made a machine learning algorithm to calibrate the sensor so the motorcycle never falls. This is really scary. <laughs> So have the motorcycle, and he's controlling it on distance from his computers, and they move forward, and then it moves backwards. So you see, he went, he went up to like uh, MathWorks to shoot the video with the engineers there, and turn right, and then turn while going backwards, which is a very complex, there you go. And he ends with, and you, what about you? So this basically is about participation. So when we're talking about education, the idea is how can you get people to engage? How can you get students to engage with teachers? How can you get, get teachers to engage with other teachers so they share and they keep on building, share resources? And eventually, how can you get all these people to engage with tool makers like us so we can make better tools for them? With engineering, it was really hard because we were talking to people and the only message we were getting is, dude, this is too easy. So I had to like take out the worst me and go like, you're going to pay and make it super hard. So basically, the activity of designing for people, to me, is something that I like to call under design, which is a term that was coined by Gerard Fisher, which is a professor in design at Colorado University in the States. And uh, I approach it from modularity and openness to things I've been talking about a little until now. And I'd like to present the work of uh, an Italian designer called Enzo Mari, who in 1974 had this idea that people should get the right to reconciliate with the idea of building their own things for the home. In 1974, the Italian design was at its peak, and people were building a lot of new stuff. And Enzo Mari said, what if people were building their own furniture? You know, he was challenging the idea of the role of the designer, saying, what if people what if my role as a designer was to let people do as they wish, instead of me telling them how they have to do? So I have to ask this question again. How many of you have ever made a chair in your life? You're studying architecture or something. Or you were very poor. <laughs> um, so, but this is the point. And somebody was thinking about students, you know, single parenting families, and so on, that had the right to have design pieces, but they couldn't afford to buy the expensive Barcelona chair, for example. And so he made this collection of furniture that you see here that was made with two simple thicknesses of wood, nails, a hammer, and a saw. So you needed very little money to get started, and he gave you all of the blueprints to reproduce exactly the, the furniture he had in the place. But if you just change the blueprints a little bit, which was his intention, you can go from the kitchen chair to the bar chair or to the children chair by changing things slightly. So at Arduino, we're thinking about this thing like, how can we embrace this idea of modularity in design in this way? And we came with this idea of building this system, which is called Project Eslov. Uh, Eslov is a really small village in Sweden that is very ugly. So we did this as a joke to IKEA that uses Swedish names for stuff. And um, so in this system, when you plug things to the computer, they automatically show up on the computer screen. This, by the way, this is 100% real, okay? This prototype works. The only reason why we don't sell it is because it's too expensive. Because price is so important. It's so important. If you make a system like this and it's costing $200, how many people are gonna buy it? It needs to have a price that makes sense. So if your task is turning a light on and off and you pay $200, I think you're overpaying and no people will really be using it in the end. So a different way of looking at modularity could be at, again, letting people build on top. And uh, this is a project that I like to show a lot. It's uh, from a Mexican uh, electronics designer called Andres, Andres Sabas. And Andres is uh, super active in helping out diff in different communities in open source. He lives in a really small place called Aguas Calientes, a uh, small place for Mexican sizes, okay? It's a lot bigger than where I come from, but... Um, and what he did is to take a maker board with LoRa, 
and he added a GPS and a barometer on top, so people could build very easily satellites. But he didn't stop there. He actually got the boards to be programmed with MakeCode, which is the programming environment from Microsoft for children pro programming. So his idea was that using this, five to 10 year old kids could make their own satellites and they could launch them. This is some teachers in Bolivia that are testing this because they will do it later with their kids. Again, somebody should tell them about holding the phone upright, but it's okay. So for less than 100 euros, you can actually make a scientific experiment. You can launch a balloon and see how it works. So these people, they're launching 30 of these in February. So this talks about reprogrammability, which is a bit the idea of like who are allowed to access the code in this small universe we're building, in these platforms we're building. So I had a couple more slides, but I'm going to jam through them, even though they were a lot of fun because I want to come to my conclusions, which is, I think, a lot more relevant. And um, I want to talk about the challenges, summarizing the whole talk. So which are the challenges for future education? Well, the first one is participation. How inclusive is your platform? Inclusive in a sense that how much ownership will I feel when I use your platform? Will you be the sole owner of the stuff? If I build, for example, a bot on top of your platform, the day you cease to exist, will my bot cease to exist? How is open source going to allow me to do stuff, you know? Then it's competitivity. If your users, for example, are using this stuff that you're building for their own interest, um, will they feel that they should share or not? How can you embrace this idea of sharing and build a healthy interaction among people? The next one is sustainability. If you're sharing everything you're doing, how are you going to make yourself sustainable? How can you, how can you set the rules for these things to work? And Yet another important thing, this is not just about machines, it's about humans. At the end of the day, we are behind these machines. So how is the cloud of humans working there? And finally, right now we're building tools that are fantastic to do things super fast, but many times we forget that development is one thing and deployment is a different thing. So making a kit for kids to use in class is one thing, but launching it in 200 schools is an entirely different story. And we tend to forget this, especially with technology, because it's very easy to get heated up and make things that feel that they work. And finally, I want to leave you with a reflection about who we are. Because I didn't talk too much about philosophy, even though I told you I spent 15 years writing a philosophy doctorate. Um, but I want to remind you that because of the way we are growing with technology, we somehow are stopping to be the humans we believe we are. We're starting to be a different kind of humans that are somehow entangled with machines. And we depend on ourselves, and we depend on the machines at the same time to exist in the world we're living in. And probably the only solution to our current global climate dystopia, for example, is to be a lot more efficient in building technologies that work a lot better, and embrace this, uh, and share data, for example. So when I show this text, I tell people, when do you think this thing was written? Because it feels like it's last week, but it's from 1950. It's for Norbert Wiener, the, the father of cybernetics. He embedded already in the theory of cybernetics the whole idea of the risk that technology could bring to people. And I would like you guys to remember that when you design your stuff. So with this, I will say thank you very much, and I'll see you outside.